Well, I was born on the 3rd of January, 1920. Yes. And the house I was born in has now been uh, demolished because of the slum clearance. So it was a very poor district and we were surrounded by industry. There was a shipyard just at the bottom of the street and on either side of us, there were trucks carrying coal from the mines down to the River Weir, where they were put into colliers and probably sent down to London. Um, I, I must have been uh, quite an advanced child because I was walking at the age of 10 months, so they tell me, and uh, by one I was going uh, along to this local shop now, I loved listening to uh, the, the children round about, and uh, especially the girls and boys who were playing games and singing. And I learned so many of their songs that I have written, uh, written them down in a book because people have said to me, they should be kept for posterity. And so I have done what they wanted me to do, and I've put them in a book. Um, at the age of four, um, I was um, ready for school, but my mother, she, she loved me so much, she wouldn't let me go. And I was nearly six before I started school. Um, they mustn't have realised uh, my potential because they were surprised when I used to get my uh, report from the school to say I was number one. <laughs> they didn't realise it was the top of the class being a number one. You see, my, my father, unfortunately, when he was a young man, he was blind. And... Uh, he was just getting his sight back by the time he was 20. So he didn't, uh, he wasn't fit enough to, 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 to join the army or do service. And uh, I don't think he read a book in the whole of his life. And I used to sometimes help him with, uh, with his reading of the newspaper. Uh, if I were reading a book, and I was probably reading the Through Men in a Boat, Three Men in a Boat, and I was really laughing about it, he would look at me and find it strange to think that I could look at black and white and, and be laughing. <laughs> but he, he just wasn't... But he was a very conscientious man and a very, very hard worker. He wasn't in uh, employment all his life, there were times when we had to struggle. And uh, he loved music. And he taught me to play the banjo when I was 10 year old. And that served me for the rest of my life because that sowed the seed mm -hmm. of my life in music. Um, I worked with him in the same factory for many years. And I noticed that when the whistle went, he started to work and he would not stop work until the whistle went to go home. Um, he would do little jobs at home, making furniture. And from an early age, I probably had to hold on why he was knocking in the panel pins, etc. Yes. So I was able to, when, when I was asked to write a, a story in school about my father's hobby, uh, well, my... I had so much to write about his music, his banjo playing and his joinery, and he was marvellous on, on a sewing machine. Yes. Most unusual, my mother never used the sewing machine, he did everything. And during the war time, when everyone had to use a, a gas mask, he made gas mask cases for all the family, and even the teachers at school used to say, can, can he make one for me? Um, now, my mother, she was very, very conscientious and very religious and a royalist too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if, if the Queen coughed, she would get the picture of the, the Queen and put it in a front room window. Um, and we were brought up to go to, well, I started Sunday school when I was one year old and I didn't stop till I was 15. But I heard the children singing in the mission hall, which was just opposite my grandmother's house. And I climbed up the steps and joined and I was there till I was 15 year old. So Sunday was a busy day for me. I used to go to church in the morning, sometimes at eight o'clock, help the vicar give uh, communion to the people in hospital. Then there was the morning service, and then Sunday school in the afternoon and morning service and uh, evening service at night. So I had a very busy uh, time. When I was about eight, the headmaster at the school said to me, uh, you, you have a nice voice, I didn't know I had, but go down to the vestry and see Mr. Bevan, the choir master. So I found my way to the vestry and he said, who are you? I said, my name's Len Gibson. And he said, oh, my best friend's called Tim Gibson. So from then on, he called me Tim. <laughs> the people in the choir called me Tim. The congregation started to call me Tim. And even my dad, when I was working, called me Tim. But I was really Len. <clears throat> now, at home, we had a, a very, very strict upbringing. Strict in this, that we had to do things properly. We sat down to a meal. Everyone must be at the table before you could start. And we all had to say, for what we are about to receive, may be truly thankful. When you'd finished, you could not leave the table until you'd said, thank God for a good meal. And please, may I leave the table. Mm. Unless you said those words, you, you couldn't go. <laughs> and... Um, at night time, when we were ready to go to bed, we had to kiss our parents and even visitors good night and God bless you before we went. I heard later that uh, when my two youngest sisters, I had three sisters, and the two youngest uh, were evacuated to Pickering in Yorkshire, and we heard that my two sisters used to say their prayers every night while they were evacuated. And the people the, of the house used to creep up the stairs and listen to them outside the door. And their, their, parents, their prayers would go on for quite a while, of course, because they had to add then, God bless the sailors and the soldiers and the, the airmen and especially our men in the army. And... Um, <coughs> We, we had a good, a, a good upbringing, but we were very poor. Yes. I had the three sisters, all younger than me, and uh, at times when my father was out of work, it was really a struggle. At the age of 11, I wanted... I, I had a teacher for the first time, a man teacher, Mr Hudson, and I loved Mr Hudson, and I said then, when I went home, I said, I want to grow up and be a teacher like Mr Hudson. Well, at the age of 11, <clears throat> and my father out of work, I hadn't a, <laughs> a chance because you had to, there were no grants in those days and it would have cost a thousand or two, which yes. my parents didn't have for me to go to, to uh, college. Now, Choir pay, we got a shilling for the first quarter, and if you were good, and you got one shilling and uh, sixpence for the second quarter, and so on. Mm. And uh, I was very careful with my money, and when I got my choir pay, I was in the choir so long, and I became head boy and soloist there. Um, I used to always put some of my money in a, in a safety place 
which was in a, 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 a shell case with a slot in. Now, at the age of 11, my parents didn't know very much about education. And they got a letter saying that I'd passed to go to West Park Central School. Well, they said, oh, he's quite happy where he is now, just let him go. And uh, the teacher said, well, he'll get a better education. <clears throat> and do you know why they said no? Because they couldn't afford to buy me a blazer and a tie and a cap. Yes. And that's where my choir pay came in very, very handy <laughs> because I got a screwdriver <clears throat> opened up my <laughs> shell case and there were 30 shillings there which was quite enough to buy a blazer, a tie and a cap. Wow. And I went to school <laughs> well dressed <laughs> because I had these this uniform on, I was the first boy or child in the area to ever pass anything like that. And they used to, well, I was ostracised, really. They, they wouldn't play with me while I had my uniform on, and they called me a West Park sissy. <laughs> <laughs> I loved going to school, but when I was 15, I wasn't finished, really. Things were very, very hard. People were out of work, even... People with degrees were, were, were pushing barrows, more or less. And um, instead of finishing the four years at uh, the secondary school, my, my dad found out that there was an apprentice needed in his factory, and they took me away from school to work mm. in the factory. So from the age of 15 until when I was 19, and I worked in the factory with my dad. Yes. It was a woodworking factory. Now, whilst in the factory, of course, we heard all the news about uh, what was happening in Germany. And um, Hitler loomed large in our life in, in the news. And um, it was decided, well, I decided that I, I, I went to see a film, and it was a short one called The Gap. And it was showing that there was a little gap in the, uh, in the defense and the Germans got through. So I, th I thought, well, uh, well, well, I'll have to do something about this. So I wanted to, to, to be ready for the for, for yes. it. And uh, luckily there was this, a, a scheme whereby, um, we could uh, join the Territorial Army. And in Sunderland, they decided they would try to make a Sunderland regiment. And within just a few weeks, hundreds of young men from Sunderland, they were joiners, they were shop workers, clerks, mm. whatever. But within, within no time at all, we had a, a regiment. It was called the second seventy fourth, and then we were promoted to be the the one two five regiment, yes. and it was a one two five field regiment, and then later it became the one two five anti tank regiment. Yes, um, I went to camp for a fortnight, but it lasted six years, <laughs> because while we were at camp. Uh, which was the 26th of August, 1939, um, Chamberlain went across and uh, got a piece of paper or came back with a piece of paper and said there was going to be peace in our time. But a couple of days later, we were declaring war. So my fortnight turned into six years and... Um, I really enjoyed army life. Mm. And one day on, on parade early morning, about 500 on parade, it, all present and correct, and then they shouted out, fall out Lance Bombardier Gibson. I, I forgot to say that by the time I was 19, I, I had a stripe. Uh -huh. and 
and uh, because I was, was so good, I got the stripe and I was given 12 older people to look after and train, which was a rather, rather a, a, a job when I was only 19 and they were all married men. Uh, however, they said, uh, called me out and they said, uh, right, get your kit packed, you're going to Catrick. Now, believe me, before the war, Catrick was like... <laughs> Nobody wanted to go to Catrick. <laughs> and it was January, February time. And when I got to Catrick, it was covered with ice and snow. It was more like Siberia. And um, I had a job to find the room where the, the lectures were to, to take place. When I did find it, I opened the door and looked inside and there were all officers standing there. So I thought, I've come to the wrong place. So I was about to go and find somewhere else when a group of sergeants arrived. And they said, no, this is it. Now, there were officers, there were sergeants and me. One stripe on my arm. I, I, I felt so inferior. <laughs> And when they said, where do you come from? They said, Sunderland. Oh, where's Sunderland? <laughs> they looked down on me. But I had the last laugh. When, the, when it was leisure time, the officers went to the officers' mess, the sergeants went to the sergeants' mess, and I was in a mess all of myself. <laughs> um, anyhow, I, I've... After five weeks, I got back home and there was a letter. It was from the head tutor. And in huge letters, right across the top, it said, Well done, youngster. Despite being the youngest in age and the lowest in rank, you've come out the highest in marks. All my marks were above 95%. Wow. So I had the last laugh, Sunderland... <laughs> It'd be the Lanarkshire Yeomanry and all the rest of the fancy ones. <laughs> Unfortunately, all my work there at Catrick was of no avail because a division in Norfolk needed an anti-tank regiment. And we were a field regiment. So they said, we will change you from a field regiment to an anti-tank regiment. Signalers, surveyors and people with brains were not needed. Mm. So I was rather disappointed to be an anti-tank. Another disappointment, I was dying to go abroad. We got into a liner called the Strathaird and happily I was going abroad, but in the North Atlantic, in a terrible storm, we collided with another liner called the Stirling Castle, and we had to go back <laughs> to Scotland. Another disappointment. Mm. They sent us down to Liverpool, where the, there was a blitz, and uh, we put out fires at night time, and... Uh, I, I thought, well, I'm not doing very much. I wanted to go abroad and I wanted to fight and here I am just putting fires out. Mm. And I noticed in Lime Street Station in Liverpool, there was a big notice saying, your country needs you. Young men wanted to be trained as pilots. Yeah, I thought that would be just nice for me. So... With, without telling my superiors in the army, I went down to Cardington in Bedfordshire to be interviewed. Now, I thought I would be interviewed perhaps lasting an hour and then I'd get back to my unit and they wouldn't miss me. But they kept me down in Cardington for three days. So I was really a deserter from the army. Now, after th three days, the they gave me a sheet of paper saying uh, I had passed fit to be trained as a pilot in a two-seater night fighter. Well, I was over the moon. 
My mother wasn't very pleased about it, <laughs> but um, I don't know whether I should tell you this, but there was another lad there wanting to do the same. He was a lad from, he said, Wall's End. I think that's Wall's End near Newcastle. And uh, he was worried because he had such a thick accent. He thought the interview board wouldn't understand him. <laughs> so the airman roundabout said, can you say actually? If you can say actually, you'll be all right. Well, poor lad, he couldn't say actually. So he didn't get through. Now, I wrote a poem about him. Would you like to hear yes, it? Please, yes, please, yes. This is in his vernacular. When I was just a nipper, I never thought out about talking. I'd just open my mouth and words would come out. It was easier than eating or walking. When I was five, I had to go into the infant school. Miss Bishop was a tartar. Do you know, she made us say that buttes were boots and water must be water. Why, we were food were hard, but it really didn't matter. Cos we'd say the proper words to her, then gun and plodge in our butts through the water. In junior school, we met Miss Rin. Her diction was fantastic. She rounded her vowels and mouth diphthongs with lips that seemed elastic. But when we passed 11 plus, we stopped pronunciation. We had no time for fancy talk in secondary education. It was maths, algebra and the Industrial Revolution, and we spoke a few words in French and quite forgot the English elocution. Then when we st st stopped school and started work, we found the old town rough, and if we said words the proper way, they'd say you were a puff. Then came that war with Hitler, and full mobilization, and I had a gun and deem me bit to save the British nation. I wanted to be a pilot, and I went before the board, and I passed first class in everything, except for just one word. So I've served six years in the army, and I've seen the war read right through, and I've always worn the khaki when I wanted to wear the blue, and the army butts are killing us, and me socks are ringing with water, but I'm getting demobbed a week today, so actually it doesn't bloody matter. <laughs> well, well done, Len, well done. <laughs> so, after the three days, I got back to my unit, which was stationed near Stockport, and luckily they hadn't missed me because they were all getting ready. We were due down to Avonmouth to go abroad again. And... Uh, I was so pleased. Yes. At last we were going abroad. In Avonmouth, near Bristol, we boarded the uh, Oronse a liner, a rough passage up the Irish Sea into the Clyde, where we joined another convoy and set out. They said we were going to North Africa. I said, that's nice, huh? nice and warm. We said we we're going to North Africa. Now, I said to the lads, if you look at the map, the British Isles is up there and North Africa is down there. So should we, we should be going that way. But we were going that way. I said, we're going to Iceland instead of North Africa. Anyhow, halfway across the Atlantic, our convoy changed because the, uh, the ex escort vessel left us and we were taken over by American Navy. What a sight to see them, cruisers, destroyers, and they came and they escorted us back to Halifax, Nova Scotia. <laughs> we went down the gangplank along the quayside and up another gangplank and discovered we were on an American ship and the Americans weren't in the war at that time. 
So we were on this ship called the Joseph T. Dickman. And uh, they looked after us very well on this ship. Of course, getting into Halifax was a, an eye-opener for us because we'd been used to the blackout in England and when we got to Halifax Harbour at night time, all the lights along the quayside, the lights on the ships, the lights on the mm. town, it, it was... It was like going to the Illuminations. Yes. We, on this ship, we called in at uh, Puerto de España, Port of Spain, Jamaica. Then we crossed the line and we were heading for Cape Town. But just before we reached Cape Town, Pearl Harbor happened. And the people on the ship, the Americans, Oh, they really, they, they felt it really. I mean, they'd been happily taking us to war, but now they were in war themselves. Mm. We had four days in Cape Town and the American Navy left us. And we then had one British cruiser called the Dorsetshire took us across the Indian Ocean to Bombay. We had a marvellous uh, Christmas dinner in the Indian Ocean. As I say, the Americans left. For, they treated us very well. Uh, we arrived in Bombay around about New Year's time. And uh, then we went up country to a place called Hamadnagar and we did some training there. Then came back <clears throat> to Bombay and on the quayside, we were expecting a, 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 this, this American ship again, but instead of that, there was an old ship there called the Empress of Asia. Now, it was an old ship that, that carried troops in the First World War. Our colonel went aboard, had a look, and he said it was, wasn't fit for us. But uh, I think Churchill told him he had to go. So we, we boarded this ship, the Empress of Asia, and set off for Singapore. Instead of going to North Africa, Pearl Harbor had happened, the Japs had happened, and now we're going to Singapore. On the 4th of February, I was awakened by somebody talk. Incidentally, I should tell you, if possible, I always slept on deck up above I didn't sleep below. And this voice woke me up shouting, get a move on Asia or we'll have to leave you. Get a move on Asia or we'll have to leave you. And when I looked over the rail, there was this uh, destroyer called the, uh, the Exeter. And the naval officer was shouting through a megaphone, get a move on or we'll have to leave you. Well, we couldn't get a move on. We were going as fast as we could, and they left us. Mm. Now, my, as I say, my, um, my, I loved being in the on the deck and right in the bow of the ship. And on this particular day, uh, the fourth of February, it was a marvelous day. Lovely, warm, and so clear, and the, the sea so calm. I looked over, I could see the bed of the ocean below. And I'd loved geography, and I'd loved being abroad. And I was thinking to myself, what a lucky fellow I am. And then 27 Japanese planes came over, and my luck nearly stopped then, because they dropped bombs, and just... On either side of me, uh, clusters of bombs, huge spouts of water and deep thuds on both sides. How on earth one didn't come in the middle and, and, and hit our ship, I don't know. It damaged both sides of the ship, they were so mm. close. Uh, and me, being in the bow of the ship, I watched it all. Now, we just escaped. Those planes went on and uh, we had a mutiny on board. 
all the stokers, this damn tools, and came out up on deck, and the, the, the captain, Captain Smith, had to go and talk to and get them to go back. Meanwhile, our colonel said, uh, any volunteers to go and stoke? Well, nearly all of us volunteered to go and stoke, but it wasn't necessary. Mm. Of course, the Japs then knew where we were, and on the 5th of February, they sent in their, their, their fighters and their bombers. And for about two hours, they tried to hit our ship, the Empress of Asia, and at last, they sent some bombs through the deck, through the officers' mess, right down into the stoke hall and set fire to the ship. Which meant that most of our guns, etc., and our equipment were in the middle of the ship, and we had to crowd into the bow of the ship to escape the smoke and the flames. Um, Meanwhile, there was a, a rare battle going on because once the Japs had set fire to our ship, they started to go and attack the other ships. Mm. The ship nearby was called the Felix Roussel, and on it were the Northumberland Fusiliers, where there were an, uh, a machine gun regiment, and they gave the, the Japs a as much as they gave them. And uh, the Japs still managed to get through and uh, start a fire on the Felix Roussel. One plane started the fire, the next plane came down, dropped a bomb in the water tank and helped to put the fire out. But what a sight it was to see the planes coming down, all the, the firepower, the tracer bullets from the, uh, the Northumberland fusiliers, uh, a, a terrific battle. And then the Exeter came close to us and uh, the Jap planes started to try to sink the Exeter. Mm. And I've never seen a ship go through the waters the, the way the Exeter did. It was like a little greyhound and, and quickly to the port, quickly to the starboard, dodging bombs as they hit the water. So the Exeter escaped, but later on I heard that a few days later they sank the Exeter off Java. And uh, one of my friends was on it and he said the, uh, the Japs sailors that picked them up treated them very, very badly. I thought there would have been a sort of camaraderie among us, mm. you know, sailors and sailors, but... Uh, he said he had a really bad time. So there came a time when the colonel and the captain, they, they stood on a bollard and they said, right, we're going to have to abandon ship. And he said, There's a, in the distance there, you can see black smoke. The captain tells me that that is Singapore and the Japs have just bombed the oil drums. <clears throat> now, I want all, all of you to go overboard and swim in that direction. No, I couldn't swim. <laughs> Everybody either jumped over or there were some bits of rope and uh, I managed to get hold of a piece of rope and lower myself down so far and then I had to drop into the sea. Uh, one thing pleased me. When I hit the water, it was warm. Mm. I'd never learnt to swim because I couldn't stand cold water, but the water was warm. Now, the lads who could swim soon left me. I was doing all the, that I'd learnt land drill. I used my land drill to make... And whilst in the sea, I looked at that smoke and I thought, well, I can see the smoke now but when it goes dark, I wouldn't be able to see it. And then I thought to myself, now, I wonder if I can swim one mile in one day. It'll take me a fortnight to get to Singapore, you know. 
And all sort of things crossed my mind. And I was wondering what my mother would think if she could see me there in the water. Now, I don't know whether I was making headway or whether the ship was drifting, but I looked back at one stage and there was the, the Empress of Asia in the distance still burning. And when I looked around, I couldn't see anybody else. You know, the sea's a lonely place when you're out there on your own. So I just kept swimming, turning on my back and having a rest and turning. And at last, I noticed a boat in the distance. Well, my, my heart started to beat. If only I could reach that boat. I nearly wore myself out heading for this boat, <laughs> thinking, uh, it might leave before I get there. And then after about an hour or so, I noticed other people in the water were going in the same direction. They probably had the same, same thoughts as me. And uh, I reached the boat and two sailors, they dropped a rope down and I sat in the rope and they just lifted me up onto the deck and uh, sent me down to have my burns seen do. And uh, I, I thought it took ages before that ship got us to Singapore. I realised then if I'd had to swim all the way, it would have taken me more than a fortnight. <laughs> um, by the time I reached Sing the harbour at Singapore, uh, I was only wearing a shirt and in my pocket was my army pay book. Nothing else. And it was drafty on the quayside, wearing just a shirt, and some lovely Chinese ladies, beautifully dressed, were trying to give us cups of coffee. Well, uh, I didn't know whether to drink the coffee or, <laughs> or, or not. And anyhow, a, a, a lorry came and took us to some billets, and um, we were given one shirt, one shorts, one, one boots, one stocks, one handkerchief, all green. And um, on Singapore, there were only four anti-tank guns. And we were the crack troop in the regiment, so we got them. We should have had about 48 anti-tank guns, but do you know where they were? They'd gone on another ship to Java. So the rest of our regiment were given rifles and had to become infantry on Singapore. We were sent up to a southern goon and uh, we put our gun ready there. And then we heard that they were surrounding us and we needed in Booker Tima Road. Well, evidently the Japs were coming across the causeway from Malia and they were going to come down Bukatima Road. So my anti-tank gun was in Bukatima Road and we would be the first to contact them when they came down. And then we had the other three um, anti-tank guns. Well, the Japs sent a, a balloon up so they could spy on us from a balloon. We could do nothing about it. We were bombed, we were shelled, we were mortared, and uh, we were in a, a private house garden. We had our gun uh, uh, ammunition there. I think there were 300 rounds of ammunition under a tree. Uh, and one of the mortar bombs from the Japs hit the tree and missed our ammunition, we were lucky. Mm. Um, so um, the, f the fighting went on for 10 days. And uh, I was still, I, s I sat on my gun all the time. I was the, I was the one that fired the gun. Mm -hmm. Now on an anti-tank gun, you've got to use your eye, your two feet and your two hands because you traverse with one hand, you elevate and depress with the other, you look through the telescope for your enemy, and with your feet, you're pressed 
to fire the gun. Well, I sat on that, waiting and waiting. As I say, one of our officers was sniped and killed. Another, Arthur Thornton had his hat blown off his head. And that, and uh, after about 10 days, the things quietened down. We wondered what was happening. And uh, somebody said, we're capitulating. And we wouldn't believe them. Now, there was a young man, he was a, a, a bank clerk in Singapore. And he had some of the young Singapore lads were in the Singapore Volunteers. And he had these lads with him. And he came up to me, he says, we're capitulating, but we're going to fight on. Will you join us? So I was ready to go and join them when a cavalcade of cars came down with the Japanese flag. There was, it was the Japanese general going down to get the capitulation. Some people said, why did you capitulate? Well, we were running out of water, we were running out of ammunition, and the Jap general had said, if we didn't capitulate completely, he would slaughter every human, um, every European in, in, on the island. So, they told us the Japs were all little fellas that wore glasses and marching down the street came all these, some of them I'm sure were six foot, hundreds of Japanese. And I took the firing pin out of my gun, put it in my shirt pocket, and I said, as soon as I get to that canal, I'll, I'll throw it in there. Then came the order, we all had to make our way to Changi. Well, depending whether you were two miles from Changi or 20 miles from Changi, you had to walk there and gather at Changi. There wasn't much at Changi in those days, except it was a, a, a civil prison. I don't think I ever saw it, because there was the land round about. We were there for a few weeks, and then we were sent down to River Valley Camp in Singapore, and for a few weeks we had barrows and shovels and we tried to clean up the uh, the debris in Singapore, which was an eye-opener for me because uh, I could see the way people lived, the, the, the people going around selling ice cream and uh, uh, the lady going around with, with, with a palanquin and m making meals on the street and selling them. And, uh, ladies getting under taps and, and washing themselves and bathing and oh, it was, and then we came to one place where there were some railings and there were some heads of Japanese Everest Chinese lads that hadn't pleased the uh, the Japs. The Singapore Times, the newspaper was changed to the Sion and Times. And um, it was full of propaganda. We were tired of hearing and seeing and learning of all the marvellous things the Japanese were doing. And it was depressing, really. And the lads in, were losing heart in River Valley Camp. And uh, a few of us, Sunderland lads, we said, should we form a concert party and, and try to cheer people up. And, well, there was three of us. By this time, I should tell you that I, my dad taught me to play the banjo when I was 10. I played the banjo with him and my sister and concerts for, for churches. I took my banjo into the army with me played up in Scotland and Wales and went abroad with me. And of course, when the Japs said fight to the ship, my, and my banjo was still there. 
And in Singapore, I was missing my banjo. And so I decided to try to make one. And the nearest thing I could make to a banjo was a guitar. Then I had, I had to learn how, I knew they had six strings. So I made a guitar using Japanese telephone wire for strings and uh, stealing bits here and there. Made the guitar and then I didn't know how to tune it up. I knew how to tune a banjo, but not the guitar. By this time, we were on a different job. We were on a hillside and we were cutting into the hillside, probably a hundred of us in a line with our chunkles digging into the hillside and throwing the soil back behind us. And I said to the lad next to me, do you know how to tune a guitar? Well, he looked at me as though I was crazy. So when the Jap wasn't looking, I moved into the next space and said, do you know how to tune a guitar? I think I worked away about two dozen people and then I found a lad, he was a regular from the East Surrey Regiment and he'd, they'd been in Singapore some time and he'd married a Chinese lady who played a guitar so who, he could tell me how to tune a guitar. <laughs> he says, of course, you'll have to know about major chords. Well, next time I was out working, I was working. <laughs> Do you know what a major chord is? And once more, I worked my way down the line until I met this man. He was an organ player from Taunton. Oh, he says, of course, do me so do. Well, I could have kicked myself because in the choir, before we ever sang or practised, we had to sing do me so do, show me do, up a semitone, do me so do, show me do, up a semitone. I'd sang major chords by the thousands. So I learned how to play them on a the guitar. And in no time at all, I joined with these two lads, especially one called Conlon Carney, and one called Con and one called Carney. Now, little Carney, he was always laughing, so he was known as Chuckles Carney. And he told stories, funny stories. He was just the lad I wanted. And uh, Conlon, he, he worked, he did so many daft things that everybody called him Jester. So there were Chuckles Carney and Jester Conlon, the three of us worked together and we devised a concert. And <clears throat> for, the co for the end of the concert, I wrote some words which were in tune to some BBC programme that had been on uh, radio. Saturday night of program, and it was we three. And so at the end of the concert, the three of us were on the stage, and we sang, and we three, we're not apart, we're a perfect company. Joe Stalin, he was on our side then, Winston Churchill and me. We three were doing well, we weren't, you know, in the air on land and sea, Joe Stalin, Winston Churchill and me. We'll beat the Bosch army and drive Hitler barmy, just wait and see. And in the Pacific, there'll be losses terrific of the mythical Jap Navy. You see, we three, we'll set you free. Soon at home, you all will be with Joe Stalin, Winston Churchill and me, me. Franklin D. Roosevelt. This was all done to try to... Little did we know those words, we free will set you free. Soon at home, we still had three more years to go. And one third of those lads that were at that concert would never see home. Because roughly, if you were a prisoner of war, you had, out of every three, one would My son was just saying to me a fortnight ago, Dad, I'm glad you didn't become a pilot because you only had w w one chance in two. He says, well, as you had one chance in three of dying. Mm. So, 
So that was Singapore. The Japs came up to us. By the way, the three of us, we, from somewhere we got a piece of paper and on the piece of paper was written, we, these three men are allowed to collect firewood for the Japanese cuckoos. And I went to the Jap lines and pinched one of their handcarts. And we went to the barbed wire and the sentry, he looked at the paper, poor lad, I don't think he could read Japanese, never mind English, and the letters out. And so for a few days, we were going out into Singapore <laughs> and going to this factory, it was called, on, this, on the factory it said Fogden's. Now, it was Fogden's of Brisbane or Fogden and Brisbane's, but they were a woodworking factory. And through wo working in a woodworking factory, I knew the smell of teak, the smell of mahogany. I loved the smell of uh, Colombian pine wood, right? So uh, while I was there, I said to the lads, now I would love a nice piece of mahogany. So while we were collecting the odd bits up to take back the Japanese cuckoos, I stole a piece of mahogany and hid that in the cart. And that's how I came to make a decent guitar. Now, the Japs came and said, we're going up to a better camp, a long way north, and you'll have better food, you'll have a lovely camp to... Uh, oh, they painted a lovely picture of a camp up north. We went down to the station and they crowded 30 and 40 of us to a, 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 a cattle truck. They wanted to close the doors, and in the heat of Singapore, we would have died no time at all. Mm. So we convinced them to leave the door open. There were so many in the truck that we organised ourselves so that for one hour you could stand up, for one hour you could sit down, for one hour you could lie down. And that's the way it went, because we were on those trucks for five, uh, five or six days and nights. Very rarely would the Japs let you off. Very rarely did you get a drink of water. And when we arrived in Thailand, at a place called Bang Pong, there wasn't even a drink of water for us. There was a Thai lady, and she was had it, uh, I think they call them a shadow. She had a long rope with, with a, a pail on, a bamboo, and she lowered it down into the well and brought water up, and she gave us all a drink each. The Japs never did anything for us. Where was our accommodation? It was an old at atap and bamboo hut that was falling down, and it was waterlogged as well. So, so much for that the new camp. Then we were told we were going to walk. And we walked right across the plains of Thailand through the paddy fields. And in the heat, we soon started to feel a bit hot and tired. And uh, then we hit the, the high ground covered by jungle, of course. And the Japs led us through the jungle, and I'm sure they were following uh, a telephone wire because it was so narrow through the, through the trees uh, and they were having a job to find their way through. Wherever, when it started to get dark at night, we just lay down in the jungle and slept. But before we started to sleep, they gave us our rice and our tea, and then they gave us what they called jippo. And uh, I have to explain that jippo was just boiled water, but into that you put anything edible, whether it be a bit of snake or a bit of a newt or, or whatever, or a bit of meat went in there, or some vegetables went in there. 
And uh, you were very lucky if you got anything uh, solid that was just like soup. So, rice, cup, tea, cup, jippo, cup, and that was it. And we were walking day after day through the jungle. It was night time, lie in the jungle, morning, rice, tea and jippo, night time, rice, tea and jippo, sleep in the jungle. At last we reached the banks of the River Kwai. There was a clearing there and uh, no huts except one, a, a small one, and that was where the Japanese officer was. Everybody else had to just sleep on the ground. I think it was there that on the way up I was thinking about our rice, tea and jippo. So just before we went to sleep that night, we were gathered round and I said, I'll sing you a song. For dinner there's rice, tea and jippo. For supper, rice, jippo and tea. And unless a miracle happens, I know what my breakfast will be. Last night as I lay on my pillow, I dreamt of a gooseberry tart to follow roast sirloin in Yorkshire, but I woke up before I could start. So that was it. We, we lived on rice, tea and jippo for, the, for three and a half years we put up with that. Then we started work. We went down to a camp called Wampo and our job was to build an em embankment. There was about a mile or so of embankment and it needed a lot and a lot of soil to build up that embankment. And we worked in threes, Connell and Carney and I. Two carried a stretcher. A stretcher was two bamboo poles on a rice sack made into a stretcher and another used the shovel, shoveling, digging the, the jungle earth out, putting it into the stretcher. Two with the stretcher would run, tip it onto the embankment and this went on all day long in the heat of the day. At night time, I don't know how it must be the British spirit, I think. But for all we were working so hard during the day, we would go, jump into the River Kwai, wash off the dirt and the dust, and then have our rice tea and chip home. We'd been suffering hell during the day, but yet, at night time, we used to always build a little fire outside the hut and we'd sit round the fire and I would get the guitar out and we'd have a sing song. And in no time we'd be singing songs, telling jokes and laughing. Knowing next day we'll be back to working hard and suffering and suffering the Japs. And yet at night time we used to forget them. The Japs couldn't understand it. They used to come out the jungle and look at us, laughing and... Um, our sing songs around the fire developed. Uh, other people would come from different parts of the camp. It was more, mainly Sunday lads that were doing it. Um, and in the end we said, let's, let's make a proper concert party. And, will give a show for the rest of the camp. Now, in our camp, there was a, a, a major called E.W. Swanton. I think he's known as Jim Swanton. Yes. He used to, used to do the cricket commentary for the BBC Two, I think. That's right. Yes. He was interested in rugby as well. Mm. And he was supposed to be our entertainment officer. So we got him to ask other people if they had any talent to join us round our campfire. And we started a concert party and we put on little shows. 
And then one night, a new fellow arrived. He said, now my name is uh, Woodward. And uh, I worked in Cabaret in Paris. And we thought he's going to be too posh for us. Anyhow, he, he joined the concert party. And one night he came, he said, now, I want a woman. And all the lads said, oh, don't we all? Uh, we hadn't seen any women for a long mm. time. Um, anyhow, he, he had this play and he wanted one woman to take a part in it. None of us would uh, volunteer. And in the end, he said, well, I'll not be able to do the play unless I get a woman. And then one voice said, I'll do it. Well, we all laughed because the voice came from an Australian tin miner who had a big, thick moustache. He had muscles like an ox and he had a voice. Oh, <laughs> and he was going to be our woman. Well, the, the shaved his moustache, the, the painted him up, they used string to make a wig. We had people who could make wigs. And he, in the end, he looked lovely. And he took the part in the play. Well, the next time Woodward came, he said, now, I want six women this time. Well, he had a job to get one woman, now we had six. So we had to draw straws. And I came out poor, I had a small straw. A lad that was at, at, he was at school in junior school and senior school with me and in the army with me. The two of us drew short straws. And another, a third one was Pat Donovan, who was a, a boxer. So we didn't feel so bad dressing up as women when we had a, a professional boxer with us. <laughs> Anyhow, the six of us, Woodward, he, he practised us. I mean, through doing marching drill, I suppose we, we did it quite quickly, but we learned how to kick our legs and bend our knees. And he used to shout, left end, muscle kick, muscle kick. And we had an accordion in the camp, a very poor accordion, and one man who could play one tune which was, I want to be happy, but I can't be. So we learned to dance to that. We didn't tell the rest of the camp what was going on. We kept it secret. Came the night of the concert. We lit fires, bonfire either side to give the light to the stage. And near the end, the accordion struck up, I want to be happy. And the six of us came on all kicking our feet. At it. <laughs> and the roar that went up from that camp was heard for miles in the jungle. It was heard half a mile up jungle where the officers, Japanese officer was, was heard quarter of a mile down the jungle where the, the people, the dysentery people were. They wanted to know what was going on. So the Jap officer said, do it again tomorrow for, for Japanese. So people in the hospital said, we want to see it. So they were brought up on stretchers, etc., and carried up and put there. And then the Jap officer, he formed all the other officers in the camps up the River Kwai, and they arrived in their barges, all posh, sparkling with them, and their swords and everything, and their batman walking behind them. You'd have thought they were going to the opera, never mind <laughs> come <laughs> concert. And they sat in the front. We gave the concert, and once more, when we came out doing the dancing, the roar from the camp, it did us good to hear them laughing and, and, and shouting. Now, at the end of the concert, we were standing there and... In those days, when you went to the cinema in England or, or the opera or whatever, or a concert, either before or afterwards, you sang God Save the King. 
Even when we were in Cape Town and Bombay, we had the national anthem. Mm. So we started to sing God Save the King. And Jap officer Hattery jumped up and he said, no king, no king, no king. So we stood like tins of milk and then Jack, who was at school with me, said, what about there'll always be in England? So we sang there'll always be in England and everybody joined in. Well, the Japs didn't worry about that, they didn't complain, but the Scots played hell. <laughs> yes. You see, we had some of the Gordon Highlanders with us. Snuffy Craig and Tammy Campbellman, all good friends of us who were from Glasgow, etc. Uh, so our concerts went very well. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we had to move camp again. So further up, as we finished the embankment, we had to go further up. And this time we're doing a cutting. So we had to use picks and shovels and uh, we had hammers and chisels, huge chisels, heavy hammers. We had to dig holes in the ground, so certain depth, so charges could be put in and blow the whole thing up. It was hev heavy, hard work, working, digging those holes. And uh, the Japs would sometimes set the charges off before we could get clear and would be showered by, uh, by rocks and things. It was while we were doing that job that suddenly one day the Japs didn't turn up. We wondered what was going on when an officer came and said, the collars hit the camp. And within one week, we'd lost over 90 men from cholera in that camp at South Tonshin. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to wash in, in the stream or weren't allowed to drink the water. So things were very hard. And uh, at night time, we were in tents at that time. Uh, there were eight to each tent. And you'd go back and find there were only seven one night and only six the next night. And you, you, we were wondering who, who would be next. And one night, there was a, a voice outside saying, hot, sweet coffee, 10 cents a cup. Hot, sweet coffee, 10 cents a cup. Why? wondered who that was and when we looked outside the tent it was the Australian Padre and when we went to him and he said church service in 10 minutes time that was the only way we could get, get his congregation <laughs> going around selling hot sweet coffee yes. which was just his word and uh, I remember I'd helped him to make a little church and build a, 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 an altar and a cross. And he wanted me to play the guitar for his hymns and even accompany when the communion was on to play serious music. Anyhow, morale was very, very low. We'd lost 90 men and uh, my fire was chosen where we could make the distilled water and that's the only cure they had that put distilled water into a vein in the foot. Mm. Anyhow, we all gathered in the church, well, the church of the opening, and uh, I can remember what his story was. It was the story of Columbus the Nina, the Pinter and the Santa Maria, Santa Maria and how some of the crew were mutinied and wanted to go back and Columbus is supposed to have said, give me three days. And, uh, Padre Thorpe, he said, uh, Harry Thorpe was his name, he said, uh, give me three days. And sure enough, <laughs> you the word went round, no new cases. There were the three words that, 
no new cases. Everybody was happy to think there were no new cases. Mm. That's how we got over the corridor. I'd managed to, to have a wash during the corridor because I got a petrol can, petrol tin, and I filled it full of water out of the, the stream and I put it on, on my fire. I always had a fire. And I've got it boiled. Now, it took about two hours to boil the water up. Uh, then it was too hot. So I stayed up nearly all night waiting for it to cool down so I could get a drink and wash myself. That was uh, South Tonson, that camp. Yes. Incidentally, <laughs> whilst we were there, about eight or nine cattle appeared. We'd never seen cattle, but they were brought up for the Japanese. But the Japanese, the bits that they didn't like, they gave to our cooks to cook. Now, the Jap officer in charge at South Tonshin was called the Tiger, and he wasn't called the Tiger for nothing. Everyone was scared of him. And one morning, he came straight up to me and he said, you, you cowboy. I knew nothing at all about cows. I'd been a town boy all my life. And he gave me these cows to look after. And then he said, you find grass. Well, where can you find grass in the jungle? Just to please him, I went around, but Bamboo is the grass of the jungle and it grows to 30 or 40 feet high. Yes. My cattle, I had to make a, a corral for them, keep them in. And there was one little brown one and it had a calf, a little brown calf. Well, I tried to feed it on young bamboo leaves. And the Japs used to take one away, every so day they would take one away and the numbers would go down. So I kept the mother and uh, calf to the last. And when it was time for the mother to go, you'd have thought it knew because that was the only time it wouldn't come anywhere near me. And I, I had to go and chase after it and lasso it. And I managed to get a rope round it, and then it set off. It ran right across the camp, right over the, the, the stream to the other side, and dragged me across, back across the stream. All the Aussies were shouting, ride him, cowboy, ride him, cowboy. And I didn't know they could back heel, and my shins, uh, if I got near its hind quarters, it would back heel in me. And uh, I had to get treatment for my legs after that. So that was a, a change for me, being a cowboy. Then came the order to move again. This time up to, that was South Tonshin, we to move up to Tonshin. Now, Jackie, the lad I was at school with, a good friend, he was suffering terribly with dysentery. I had malaria and the Japs lined us all up to go and they told us to wait, we couldn't go with them. Well, we didn't want to lose our friends. They were nearly all Sunderland lads, we our friends. And when the Japs wasn't looking and he'd marched them off, Jack and I, ran and got onto the end of the, the queue. Every so often, Jack had to leave and being, having dysentery, had to leave and go into the, into the jungle and they would get farther away from us. The Jap in charge would come back and shout at us and I would shout, uh, Ichi man ben Benjo, that was going to the toilet and uh, he, get his stick out and threaten us. And then when Jack went off the second time, the, the Japs came up at us again. And uh, in the end, he said, no good, no good. 
and he just waved his hand and they left us. So Jack and I were left to find our own way through the jungle, which wasn't too bad when it was daylight, but when it got dark, we didn't know where we were. And uh, we just kept feeling our way through the jungle. And at last, there was a, f a light. And we said, oh, there must be a camp there. So we hurried on <clears throat> and there was a fire and, and one man sitting at the fire. And talk of coincidence, as we approached the fire, Jack and I, who had been to school together, the man at the fire said, hello, Jack, hello, Len. He'd been at school with us. <laughs> Three West Park lads all together. We, he was so pleased to see us and we were so pleased to see him. <clears throat> but then uh, the mood changed because he told us of all our friends that had died in that camp. And some of them had been in our form at school. So that was Tonshin Camp. Mm. Once again, we were out with picks and shovels. And uh, I don't know what happened. I know it was really hot and I was, wasn't feeling so good. And I woke up and I was in a hut. And when I looked round, there was only one other man in this hut. <clears throat> and I said, where am I? And, and uh, an orderly said, you're in, in the, the hospital court. I said, what's wrong with me? And the MO came and he says, well, you've got typhus and you've got to starve for, for two weeks. I said, I've been starving now for months, never mind two weeks. So I had this typhus, just terrible headaches, terrible sweating, and there was only this other one man. <clears throat> now, I knew that was the hospital camp because they had a thermometer. It took my temperature. 103, and they went to this other fellow, 103. I never saw who he was. I could just hear what they were going on. The next morning, 104, 104. And so it went on for days and days. And then one morning, he came to me and he said, 103. And they went to him and said, 104. And a voice said, I'll beat you, you pommy bastard. <laughs> and I knew he was an Australian. Yeah. From then on, we became good friends. Now, never ever say things couldn't be worse. Because Conan and Carney, my friends, who evidently they'd carried me there from the, the work. They came to see how I was getting on, and I said, oh, things couldn't be worse uh, because I was really low. And just after they'd gone, two scorpions fighting in the atap, dropped on my chest, just about there, and both of them bit me. Well, I went to the orderly, the medical orderly, and he's, there were four little red holes. And he said, well, I haven't anything for scorpion bites. And, and he painted me with some, some purple stuff. And he said, now, don't lie down or you'll die. I don't know where he'd learnt his medicine, but uh, that was his, his advice. So all night long, I just wandered round and round the huts. And sometimes clockwise, sometimes anti-clockwise. Sometimes picking the guitar up. And mm. softly playing and singing to myself. But all the time, I was thump, thump, thumping. My head was thump, thump, thumping. Even my arms kept thump, thump, thumping from this, uh, this typhus. It was worse than the, the malaria I'd had. I'd had malaria many times, but typhus was worse. So I managed to get rid of that. But by this time, all my friends had moved further up country and I was left on my own. Nobody to look after me. 
and I heard that some of my friends were down at Tarso. So I just slipped out and tried to find my way through the jungle on my own, following tracks to get down to Tarso, where it was amazing. As I walked into the camp at Tarso, my very, very, very best friend came up and said, hello, Len. Now I had a beard and he had a little pair of scissors. So my best friend, Wilf, he sat me on a tree stump and he spent nearly half a day with the little scissors getting rid of my beard for me. While we were doing that, another person approached us, a skeleton, and they said, this skeleton said, hello, Len, hello, Wilf. And we realised it was a, the third man of our group that used to go together. He later became a chief inspector of the police uh, for, for this area. But at that time, he was only about eight stone and you could see every bone in his body. So that was Tarso.